Now, don't worry about that. <laughs> then I'd have to go back to the old system. Ah, I think that, that people might be able to copy this first one, but if I now do this second one, you have to know when the people email saying they're not going to the class. And I think there's still way to manipulate the past. It can happen in my email. Alright, I'm going to go ahead and start. Everybody turned in. Everybody who wants to turn in a write-up, turned in their write-up. Ah, Sydney, thanks a lot. Okay, remember what this class is about. It's about investing. What, broadly speaking, does the process of investing involve? Obviously, first, trying to identify opportunities that you can focus on, where at the end of the day, if it looks good, you understand why it's good. Opportunities where you're likely to be on the right side of the trade, based on either special knowledge or the kind of psychological behavior in finance, the behavioral finance, the irrationalities that people talk about, that Tano talked about in the first class. And you always want to start there, and of course, I'm really good with names, Jacob is going to start there for us. Once you've identified that opportunity, what you want to do is value it in the most reliable way possible. In theory, I'm agnostic about how you value things. As long as you're using all the information, you're concentrating on building in the strategic assumptions that you can reliably make about the future, and you're trying to organize information by reliability class. And also where you know, and we're going to get into this next week, sort of what the connection is between your assumptions and the value you're putting on things. Now, the emphasis there, and I want to talk about a remark that came up outside class, is don't just try and apply a formula. So somebody says to me, Ben Graham said you had to do 10 years of earnings to get an earnings power. Why didn't you do 10 years of earnings for Hudson General LLC? Why didn't I do 10 years of earnings for Hudson General LLC? And here is the crucial thing. What is going to be an inherently more reliable indicator of earnings power? The Lufthansa bid or earnings from 10 years ago on this company? The thing about 10 years is things change over 10 years. And we have a very reliable forward-looking indicator of what this company is worth and presumably what its earnings are worth. Now, we do want to verify that that's a sensible bid. So we do want to look at an earnings power value to the extent we can. If we could have gotten a good asset value, we'd want to look at a good asset value. But going back 10 years is not going to give us a lot of additional reliable information once we've got that bid. Is that clear? You want to collect all the information and evaluate how you proceed in the context of doing as well as you can. In a sense, ideally what this framework would lead you to do is look at information that has real salience for calculating the value of the company or the security that nobody else is looking at. So it's a matter, I think, of exercising judgment and being creative much more then it's a question of saying the rule is 10 years of earnings, <laughs> average it out, and that's what we're going to take as earnings power. If you do that, and this is the thing you have to remember, you can be replaced by a computer. And that's more humiliating than being replaced by somebody at a call center in India. <laughs> So we're going to do evaluation, 
And then, and we're going to start to talk about today, that valuation, together with our search strategy, should raise issues about where the potential vulnerabilities, the traps, the downsides are in this investment. And we're going to talk about that today, and then ultimately you've got to manage those risks. In terms of valuation, I'll do this quickly. So the things we're hoping to take advantage of are obviously individual biases we've talked about, reinforced by institutional behaviors. By the way, these first six slides are, if you remember, nothing else about the course you'll do fine with. How are you going to do the valuation? You're going to start with the asset value, then the next most reliable information, the earnings power value. And we're going to talk about growth value starting next week. In terms of broadly what you're going to see when you've done the analysis, you're going to see one of these three cases. Either where the asset value exceeds the earnings power value, that's normally because you've got a crappy management. In that case, you might buy, pay for the asset value, but the crucial thing is, is that asset value going to be realized? And quickly, because in that first case, if they reinvest your money to grow, they are almost certainly going to destroy value because they're going to earn less than the cost of capital. The crucial thing in that case is the proxy stage. Are you going to be able to get control away from the value destroying process that's going on. In the second case, that tells a story too. It tells a story of a market that is not protected by barriers to entry with an average to okay management. And in that case, you have two independent observations on the value here. Typically, what do you have to do to make money in that second case? You have to wait for your price. If that value is $4 billion, you want to wait till you can buy that company for $2 billion, or ideally less. Finally, in the last situation, which is the Coca-Cola, all the big famous high capitalization companies that sometime in the distant past people got really rich on, is where you do have earnings power well in excess of asset value. The power of that situation is growth creates value in that situation. In the middle situation, it neither creates nor destroys value. What is the critical thing that you have to verify in that last situation? If in the first one, it's can you get rid of management. In the second one, is, is the price what you want. In the third one, it's is that level of earnings power sustainable. And since it's not protected by assets, it's exactly what Tano talked about last time. Is there a franchise here? And you have to know, if you're going to dabble in stocks like that, what these franchises look like. To sustain above average earnings, you need barriers to entry. Unless you're connected in some way to guys with black shirts and white silk ties with guns, Barriers to entry means being able to do something that potentially entering competitors can't do. So barriers to entry are equivalent to incumbent competitive advantages. The incumbent competitive advantages are small in number. Michael Porter manages to find 150 factors in everything he looks at. You're better off with three. <laughs> You're going to have a better cost structure, which is proprietary technology or proprietary access to specialty resources. You can have access to customers that that entrant can't match, which is customer captivity. And last and most importantly, you can have scale that, because it's protected by some degree of customer captivity, that entrant cannot match. Now, the reason that last condition is so important is that if you've got proprietary technology, if you've got a proprietary a asset, you own Madonna, they tend to die over time. New technology displaces the old technology, your advantage goes away. They are a finite law. 
You can extend the life in some cases, but ultimately they're going away. Madonna is not going to be Madonna when she's 92 years old. Well, she probably will be. But Beyonce will not be Beyonce when she's 92 years old. Special purpose assets like that, whether they're mining assets or special employees, again, have finite lives. By the way, cost advantages tend to be much shorter lived than demand advantages. Demand advantages, however, die with customers too. I mean, if you have captive customers who are teenagers, they're going to grow up, and when they grow up, they're no longer going to like the idea of walking around naked to the waist, and they're not going to be Abercrombie customers anymore. <laughs> that they move on. So captive <laughs> customers die too, in at least a functional or an actual sense. Again, that means that in both these cases, to sustain that competitive advantage, you have to have an advantage in the market for recruiting new technologies or for recruiting new customers. And what gives you that is economies of scale. So when you think of somebody who's recruited new technology again and again, you want to think of Intel. Intel has dominated the chip market through 15 generations. Why? Because they have enough captivity so they can expect to get bigger scale than their competitors if they succeed with the chip. That means they can spend more on R&D. Spending more on R&D because it's a big fixed cost gives you an economy of scale advantage. If they're spending five times what AMD is, they can turn out a new generation of chips three times as fast as AMD. And that means in the long run, they're going to win that race all the time, and they have. So the economy of scale advantages in technology and R&D translate into a continuous sequence of cost advantages. For Coca-Cola, actually, the same is true. Coke has a lower cost of distribution and advertising because it has advertising as a fixed cost, and it's got much higher sales than its rivals in that area. So the per unit cost of advertising for them is much lower than for its competitors. Per unit distribution costs are also lower. That means they can recruit new customers with more advertising and lower prices, and unless they're stupid like giving Pepsi a march and sort of preferred access to the young customer market, they ought to be able to sustain that advantage through successive generations of consumers. So the critical thing here is economies of scale. Another way of saying that, for those of you who are economists, the only truly sustainable monopolies are natural monopolies. The ideal is a one-store town where you are the store. What that means is, if you want to know who's going to have sustainable competitive advantages, it's the people who have big scale, market by market. It doesn't help to be the biggest HMO and have 20% of Houston, have 20% of Chicago, and 20% of Los Angeles if you're competing in New York. Because a guy has 80% of New York and he's smaller than you, he's still going to dominate the New York market. So it's scale on a market-by-market -market basis. And what it means to have scale on a market-by-market -market basis is to be the dominant competitor. So what you're looking for, ideally, is small local markets, because they're a lot easier to dominate than big global markets. And sometimes investors will not recognize, because these are small local markets, exactly how powerful the competitive positions of the people who are disciplined about dominating small local markets. Big global markets are difficult to dominate. All the firms that dominate those markets, with the possible exception of Boeing and Airbus, dominate narrow product segments. If you look at the evolution of the personal computer industry, the big, broad suppliers, IBM, Apple, who try to do everything, are gone. The people who make all the money are the specialists. Microsoft and operating system software, which they extended just like Walmart did geographically. 
Oracle in database management, which they extended to enterprise applications. Google in search. Intel just in CPU chips. And Adobe in fonts. It is the specialized people who've done well, because if you've got a global market, you're not going to dominate a big global market, because people will be viable at 2 to 3%. You want to dominate a small segment where the entrant has to be able to get, say, ideally, a third of the market to be able to do. So, in a sense, Porter is wrong. There are not two generic strategies out there. A low-cost strategy is a necessity if you're in a competitive market with no barriers to entry, and you therefore have to just be absolutely as efficient as you can in all the various dimensions, probably more than two. There are only niche strategies. And if you think about the really dominant firms, as I say, Walmart does niche strategies. It dominates one geography, moves to adjacent geographies. When they try and go up against people who have local scale in Korea, in Japan, in Germany, they get slaughtered. If they try and go to England where other people have scale, they had to buy their way in, and that's not necessarily a profitable strategy. So you want to start with local markets and expand at the margin. So if you really want to know what franchises look like, they're niche franchises in either product space or geography, coupled with a very disciplined growth strategy that takes advantage of that local dominance at the margins. Are there any questions about that? Because if you understand those six slides, you're halfway through this course. Yes. Right. Why would you be kind that your four billion is the wrong estimate? Yeah, probably that actually the real value is two and you made our wrong. How do you answer that question? I mean what tell me, because we've talked about that endlessly in this room. Yeah, What's the first part of the answer to that question? So you value you no, that's not the first answer to that question. Anybody else? Let me go to my expert here, because it's going to be time for him to do it for Magna International. How many people, by the way, thought Magna International $20 a share? And by the way, it got down to 19 last March, was worth a bond. Good, because you saw on the tear sheet it's up to 48 What do you think it's at today? $56 a share. Okay, now why should you have had confidence about that, Jacob? Where are you? Okay, what is, start with what Magna does and then talk about, and what's your name? Talk about Alejandro's question. Why at the end you might have confidence if it looks like it's a bargain? Okay, so uh, Magna is a diversified auto supplier. They make all sorts of parts and systems um, that they sell to the OEMs. Um, now tell people who OEMs are. Well, the big three automakers, any of the... Well, who, do they, who are their customers actually? Ford, Ford, Chrysler, GM, who else? BMW, Porsche, Toyota, Toyota Mercedes. Actually, they don't do Toyota. It's everybody but the Japanese. <laughs> okay, so they have a broadly diversified international pandemic. What kind of things do they do for those auto companies? Do they just make standard parts and sell them to them? No, well, they do all sorts of different They will do the whole part, but what's your sense of, if you were Ford, what do you come to Magna to do? Would you come to Magna and say, look, I need hubcaps? No, it would be, it's, there's an engineering expertise. You want fairly complete, complicated assemblies. So you'd say, I need a dashboard electronic harness that I can hook the instruments into. Will, they will then cooperate with that company, design it, produce it to specification. Does that make that a better or a worse business than Hubcaps? Why? Well, because they have, they have some uh, engineering expertise. 
And what advantage does that engineering expertise do? Yes, exactly. Once Mercedes has learned to rely on them to do a good job on those complicated assemblies, they should rely on not be interested in trying anybody else. Okay, so that's the first thing. They have some captivity. With respect to Mercedes, do they have any cost advantages other than just the captivity? Yeah, or with any of the big automakers. Well, they do business globally, so I think that would give them some cost advantage. Now, why does doing business globally give them some cost advantage? So there they are in Austria producing stuff for BMW, actually. Why does that help them supply GM in Detroit? Well, they operate decentralized. Yeah, if they're decentralized, why does global scale matter then? Why isn't it local scale that matters? Locally or globally? Locally. Exactly. So does the global scale matter here at all? Anybody? No. <laughs> what they do is if they develop expertise, there may be some fixed costs associated with that expertise. And they may be able to dominate that market for those kinds of parts locally because you're not going to ship them over long distances. Does this start to look like a better business than just hubcaps? Yes. Okay, yes. How would you feel if you were BMW and they did that? Well, I'm not saying trade secrets, I'm saying Com competencies might travel, but what would you have to do to make the competencies travel? No. Well, standardize. Is BMW interested in <laughs> these are so they advertise the BMW Star Class, same parts as GM, <laughs> or these days, same parts as Toyota. What do you typically have to do to translate expertise? You've got to move the people. So you may get some expertise at a high level, but you're not going to move Austrian engineers or Canadian engineers. <coughs> But so probably the critical advantages here are local. They work very closely with these suppliers. Do they have a broad or narrow range of suppliers? Uh, broad. Broad. They got a lot of them. They're fairly diversified. Okay. Jacob. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry, I'm just fine remembering Jacob's name. <laughs> go ahead. Did they wind up buying Opal? Did, was there a previous scare that they were going to buy something else? Did anybody read in the history of the company beyond sort of the boiler crate and just the annual report? Did anybody just go on the web? They got into the bidding for Chrysler. What did they do in both cases? What did they do in the Opal deal? They were ready to walk away. Now, in the end, General Motors decided they wanted to keep up. But what did they do in the Chrysler deal? Right. How did they lose? They wouldn't get enough money. <laughs> That's how you lose an auction. <laughs> Is that a good sign or a bad sign? Does it say something about them, Jacob? They're pretty careful in what they do, and they're not going to spend money just to grow. Do they have any other natural advantage? I mean, why? what do you think has happened to the parts industry as a fraction of total automobile value added compared to the big three or the big global auto companies? Do you think they're bigger or smaller in the last 20 or 30 years? You think a higher fraction of the total car is made by parts companies like Magna, or do you think a higher fraction is increasingly made by the big automakers? It's the suppliers. Why? What does Magna have, especially in Europe, that Volkswagen and Daimler and BMW don't? Sorry? Uh, anybody's got power trains, right? 
right? There's no way the technology is just available. Why? And if it wasn't available, why would they hand it out to men? What brought GM down ultimately? Yes. They have lower cost labor because they generally have more non-union labor. To the extent that they have union labor, they signed those contracts later in the game and they avoided all the costs. Is that arbitrage going to go away, Jacob? So they are competing potentially with other parts makers, but at least backward integration is probably not a threat here because at least relative to the big automakers, they are doing a labor arbitrage. Alejandro, so what did we start out thinking about whether this would be a good investment? Here? We want to know the quality of the business. Are there competitive advantages? And are these people reasonably good managers? If the answer was no on both counts and we thought we had a bargain, and we've made aggressive assumptions on earnings, we'd be a lot more worried. So we have qualitative judgments about the nature of business. But what's the crucial thing in getting a bargain here? In knowing that you haven't made a mistake on the valuation? Well, that it's going to bounce back. But more generally, Jacob, Jesus, <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> I started with Merck at breakfast. I did Jim Chanos, and now I'm here with you. It's just a complete range of experience. <laughs> Jacob, sorry. <laughs> What's the crucial thing in a bargain? What are you going to talk about next, now that we've talked a little bit about the company? Well, on a macro perspective, we're in March 2009, so we're in the middle of the financial crisis. What in the first class here did Tano talk about? Yes. Bargains. Why is this company likely to be a bargain? That's what we're looking for. There's something ugly and diseased about this sucker. In March of, or actually as early as February of 2009, that means if we're willing to look at it carefully, we shouldn't be surprised to see it's a bargain. What about that, Jacob? Yeah, I mean, that So net income is down. That's not a happy thing. Anything else about it? Yes. Uh, at that time, and possibly now, everyone hates the um, automobile industry. Everybody thought the automobile industry was going to die. This is in autos. General Motors is busy going bankrupt. One of their biggest potential customers is going under. Are people selling a lot of autos in March 2009? So they are in an ugly industry. Does that help, Alexander? Anything else about March of 2009? Was that a happy time? Where were you guys in March of 2009? And how, how far down have you chewed your fingernails? Sorry? <laughs> What was going on in March of 2009? What was everybody saying? Go ahead. Well, everybody was going to go bankrupt. We were going to have another Great Depression. So it's not just that autos are bad. Is the timing good or bad? And is the timing particularly bad for manufacturing companies that are subject to big cyclical fluctuations in demand? And what was the one hope at that time for the automobile industry? When everybody lost their houses, they live in their cars. <laughs> and therefore, you could sell automobiles. Does that make this an ugly time to look at this stuff? Okay, anything else about this particular company? Jacob, when you read it, did you notice anything else about this company? not even the beginning of the big thing. Does anybody know this company and know what the big thing in this company is? Yes? They got super voting shares. They got super voting shares and who exercises those super voting shares? 
Who's the management that controls this? Is there a Canadian here? Who's the management that controls this company? Frank Stronach. What's Frank Stronach like? Did anybody read the related party footnote? Go to that footnote. You know what it is? I've got it here someplace. Oh, well, well, we'll go through it in detail, but go to the related party footnote first. Frank Stronach controls this company. He's got 22% of the economic interest, and he controls the whole company. The related party footnote is 23, page 23, note 23, 251 in your case book. We'll come to Belinda in a second. I'm going to read you something here. We have agreements with affiliates of the chairman of the board for the provision of business development and consulting services. Who's the chairman of the board? Frank Stronach. So you're hiring all his buddies. In addition, we have an agreement with the chairman of the board for the provision of business development and other services. The aggregate amount expensed under these agreements with respect to the year ended December 31st, 2001 and 2007, was $10 million and $40 million respectively. What is going on there? Well, you pay this guy a salary, but he's really not happy with that. So what he does is he's got a consulting firm that made $10 million in 2008 and $40 million in 2007. Guess who's the only employee of that consulting firm? <laughs> Frank Stronach. Does that make you feel good about this company? Jacob. Anything else about Frank Stronach? Let's, we'll get to Belinda in a second. Read what else was going on there. What else does he do in that related party footnote? Go ahead. All the real estate for the company is built by who? Frank Stronach. <laughs> and he rents it to the company at above average market rates. He also builds these facilities in the middle of properties that he owns all the outlying properties. Anything else about Frank Stronach? What else do they buy there? Land in the golf courses and land in Austria. Where's Frank Stronach from? Austria. Guess what that land is? Land next to his houses that he doesn't want development on. What else did Frank Stronach do? Does anybody know the history of this company? He was a big horse racing guy. So he established a subsidiary of this company called Magna Entertainment. Magna Entertainment bought all the racetracks that he wanted to run his horses on that he felt weren't treating him right. Magna International and Magna Entertainment went bankrupt. Magna International Entertainment. What's happened, by the way, to Magna International Development that does the buildings and Magna International Entertainment? Anybody follow that? They both have been spun off. So those particular ripoffs are history. Now we come to Belinda. <laughs> What's Belinda famous for? Having an affair with Tyomi. Tyomi, forget it. Having an affair with Bill Clinton. <laughs> and Belinda previously was being groomed to replace Frank Stronach as chairman of this company. For a year, she was the number two in the company. Thank God Bill Clinton actually did something beneficial <laughs> via his social life, which is she got involved with him, she got interested in politics because of it, and her father decided to do what with her instead of making her head of Magna International? Well, he decided he was going to make her Prime Minister of Canada where she'd do a lot less damage. <laughs> So 
because she became a conservative MP in Canada. And what happened next? Just when they were about to dissolve the government, the conservatives had a minority. She crossed the floor to the liberals. Why? They made her a minister. Health, yeah. Like they, they made her a minister of health. All of you who believe in Canadian health care. <laughs> <laughs> so now I come back to you. It's Giovanni? No. It's <laughs> Sorry. Alejandra, close enough. <laughs> Alejandra, now I come back to you. Why do we think this company is a bargain if indeed it is? Sorry? This is an ugly disease company. And if we look at it carefully and find out that we don't think it's that disease, and we have reasonable confidence in that because we've done a careful valuation, and we've looked carefully at just how much stealing is going on here, whether there's some hidden stealing. <coughs> Would we be surprised to find out that this was a bargain? That in the middle case, this company is actually selling for a price below what it's worth. Yes, everything. It's in a horrible industry. It's a horrible time. It's a horribly run <laughs> company. Now, the thing you have to know is, fortunately, and I don't mean this in a mean way, Belinda got breast cancer. She survived, and she's now concentrating on being a breast cancer survivor, so she's no longer likely to be head of this company. So that particular bullet has been dodged. And what she does as executive vice president of special projects is she works on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There are many lawsuits pending. But they don't actually involve Magna because those would have to be disclosed. They involve, there's a huge lawsuit around Magna International Development, which is the property development on, and there's a set of lawsuits around Magna. Yeah, they do have a disclosure in the football, good stuff. All right, Raul, so how are you going to decide what this is worth? Where are you, Raul? Yes. What do you want to start with? Exactly. How do you want to start with the asset valuation? So, uh, I went down the list of categories. Okay, can I do something that will help you a little bit? Because there is something that people do a lot that you ought to be familiar with because you'll see it. Oh, actually, can you, let, me, let me turn the lights off. This is not showing sure. so well. Turn off every light in the room. That's really my mechanical skill. I'm trying to turn off the lights in the front. Can you see that better? It's in the upper right-hand corner? Yes. Okay. There is one particular set of assets that people concentrate on very often. So what they'll do is you ask first, how much are you paying for this company? And what you're paying is roughly there are 112 to 113 million shares outstanding. The price was about $20 a share. So you're paying roughly, if you look in the upper right-hand corner, about $2.24 million billion for this company. It had $2.676 billion in cash. Now, it also had $1.2 billion in debt, and what was that $194 million in investments that was later on? There's a big footnote about that. Anybody? Yes. Which, right. Sorry? Well, they were toxic assets, but they were going to collect in the end. They just weren't going to collect on time. They couldn't roll them over. So they moved down from being a current asset and a cash asset to a non-cash asset. Approximately what are they worth? The 194 is a pretty good number. So that's really a financial asset. That's not an investment in some company. If you subtract the cash, the investments, from the sum of the debt and the market capitalization, you're left with $498 million. What does that represent? 
Do I have a shot at that? I mean, the word for this that gets talked about is the enterprise value. What does that roughly $500 million represent? Yes? The uh, operating assets? For the it's what you're paying for the operating business. <laughs> that if you bought all the stock, you paid back all the debt, and you took out all the excess cash in these Canadian asset-backed notes that you got from recovering them in the end, that's what you would have left that you paid for the enterprise. The term of art for that is an enterprise value. Now, some people will add things like the unfunded pension liabilities. In this case, those are positive some years and negative. It's not a big number. You may not have to do that because that's a real debt that you have to pay off for. So we are paying 500 million roughly for the operating business of Magna International. Does that start to look attractive or not? Well, how much does Magna International have in sales? $24 billion, $23 billion, as high as $25 billion. And what do operating earnings typically look like in any given year? I mean, this is a bad year, but if you look over the history that you've got. That's 600 to 700 million a year. You run your eye just over the last three years. What do you think of being able to buy an operation with 24 billion in sales and 700 million in operating earnings in any given year for 500 million dollars? Does this look interesting, Alejandro? Because what you're mostly buying is, just as in the case of Hudson General, a ton of cash. All right, Raul, go ahead. Do what you do. Well, so I, uh, I uh, did the introduction. Here, I've actually got a balance sheet. So hold on just a second. If you want to talk through it, there's a down. Go ahead. So I looked at cash as well, obviously. Cash receivable. Okay. Inventory. I left as is, but at some point, I wasn't sure what to do with two of them in the year. So I should take that out. Okay. Oh. What he did is, for the first parts of the balance sheet, he decided, for the first run through, he's not going to make much in the way of adjustments up here, right? Just to get a view. What are the items that you're going to probably make the big adjustments on? Fixed assets and then intangibles, right? So why don't we just simplify this and just start with the book value of this. And then start with the book value over there at the top of 7,363 million. And then just do the adjustments for the intangibles and the property plan equipment. Because I think those are your big adjustments, right? Yeah. Actually, the property Oh, you left that? Yeah. Did anybody do an adjustment to fixed assets here? Anybody want to see an adjustment to fixed assets? Yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't have let this get in a mess here. Uh, here we go. Okay, if you want to see what that adjustment might look like, just in case it might be material, the land and buildings have been there for a long time. You can actually trace back 
and look at the history of original cost. So if you had today land of 212 that you bought for $212 million about 10 years ago, you think it's worth more or less? Sorry, go ahead. So you think this land is actually worth substantially less. So if somebody else wanted to come in and set up a factory. But no one wants to set up a factory in the East region. They want to set up a factory. No, but again, if somebody wanted to compete with you, if say, say the auto industry came back, do you think they could buy the amount of land that you have for 212 million? And don't forget, not all of it by any means is in Detroit, where in fact is a lot of it we know internationally in Austria and other places. And actually it's spread all over Canada. You think you could really, you'd be likely to be able to buy it for 212 million. Now, some of it has clearly gone down. My guess is that land values over the last 20 years, even with the crash, are higher. Yes? So short of hiring an assessor, what are some of your things that... Again, what I would do is exactly what Raul was doing. Is do a first cut and then see if you need to make a careful calculation later. Okay, so what I did was I just wrote it up by about 25%. It's not a big write-up. It certainly didn't depreciate that much over time. And if, yes? Right, but if it, remember, it's the asset that if it wasn't needed by a competitor, what could you do with that land? That might be overstated in value. And how much did they pay for the golf course as well? So, all right, so there's another argument the land could be undervalued. So maybe the land is worth the 200. What about the buildings? You think they're the cost of construction has gone up or down since they put these buildings up. How many people think construction costs have gone up over time? How many people think down? So the reproduction cost of the buildings has gone up. Again, I just did 25% on the buildings because they don't really depreciate and the reproduction cost goes up. Again, the difference that I'm adding here is about 257 267 million dollars. What about the machinery and equipment? That's where really all the, uh, by the way, construction and progress is already at reproduction cost. So the CIP, which is called in progress on your balance sheet, is 313. What do you want to do with the 770 in machinery and equipment? By the way, all of this is on the footnote that tells you the composition of the fixed assets, I'll just show you that briefly. What we're doing is we're working down this footnote. And this, by the way, is the footnote on the investments of $194 million that will tell you what's there. So you can see the land at 212, the buildings at 856, the end progress at 313, and then you've got the machinery and equipment at 770. Well, roughly how far through its lives is that equipment? I mean, if it was, if the investment is not going up all that much, it's going up reasonably slowly, an average piece of equipment is, if it was constant, how far through its life would an average piece of equipment be? <coughs> Halfway. So why don't we just, as a first approximation, take half the original cost and then adjust it for the change in the prices of equipment. Do you think equipment costs have been going up or down? Down. And they've been going down 4 to 5% a year. So if you take four years, because the average life of this equipment is eight years, and you take the decline in value because it's sort of four years to go, at roughly 4.7% a year, you should be able to buy the replacement equipment at 20% less than the original cost. So we're going to divide this by 1.12. So basically what I did with the equipment was take half of it, 
and adjust for, just as we did with the buildings, for the trend in reproduction cost, divided that by 1.20. And I wound up in that case with a number of about 3208. If I add that to the 1648, I get about 4.8 to 4.9 billion. What's the book value of that equipment? It's about 3.5 billion, or 3.7 billion, sorry, because I've got all this depreciation on the books. However you do it, does it look like there's roughly a billion dollars in excess value? in that equipment, and buildings, and land. It's not a small adjustment in this case. And he's clearly depreciating very rapidly, and probably inappropriately rapidly, when you apply a reasonable standard. So the first major adjustment is you actually have here substantial real assets that may or may not be valuable in the future, but what's going to determine whether they're valuable in the future and therefore get reproduced? The earnings power of these things. So for the moment, let's just look at the cost of reproducing these assets. So we've got the book value. What I'm going to do first, by the way, is subtract the net cash because I want to look at the book value of the enterprise. I'm adding back about 1.1 billion because I'm more generous with the land and buildings than you. You'd be adding back less than that. Yes, go ahead. And what do they do to those old plants? They write them down. Well, let's, what do you want to do with the accounting goodwill for all those plants that they bought? I think the, the let's just set it to zero. Okay? Okay, so let's next subtract the goodwill, which almost exactly offsets this excess value of the plants in place. I, I mean, just to, to analyze the current plants. They had 280 plants. If I think the... You could do that, but let me come back to that, because I think you're making your name is... Eric, I think you're making the same point Eric is. But let's do a quick run through this at a reasonable level. Let's see what the asset value looks like compared to what we're paying for the company. Let's see what the earnings power value looks like. And then let's see what kind of a bargain, what kind of a story gets told by those two. What about intangibles? Could somebody enter this business with just the plants and the working capital? So we've wiped off the goodwill, the accounting goodwill. But are there intangible assets there that you really need to run this business? Yes. Your customer relations. What's a good measure of customer relations here? Well, how about the amount of sales that you've actually achieved? Because that's out of these relationships with the customers. What do you think a typical sales commission to an independent agent is for making a sale of that magnitude? It's about 5 to 10%. If I took 7.5% therefore, which is the commission somebody got somebody to do, they had to pay to an independent contractor who signed up the companies, I took seven and a half of 24 billion. How much do those relationships look like they're worth? A lot. Reproducing 24 billion in sales on a detailed basis to companies for fairly complicated assemblies is not going to be cheap. So that's about 1.8 billion. And how many workers are there at Magna? There are 80,000. Would it be easy to replace 80,000 trained auto workers who are making fairly intricate assemblies? Well, they get paid. Their compensation is probably about 50,000 a year each. 
What does a search firm get for sort of a mid-level engineer? They get about a fifth of a year's salary. So if you got them through a search firm, you pay about $10,000 a worker. So that's another $800 million that somebody who wanted to reproduce this business would have to do. And finally, what's the other work that they've done? It's this custom design. If you read the 10K, they spend about $575 million a year on that custom design. How many years does the product last? Again, it lasts for the product cycle of the car. It's about four years. That's another $2.3 million. This is not that easy a business to get into. How long did it take Sternock to build up from $6 billion to $24 billion? About 10 years. You just look at this as a number of years of SG&A, which we talk about in the book. It's about three and a half. Does that seem like a good number or an approximately reasonable number for what it would take to reproduce those intangibles? This operation is not cheap to reproduce. So when you do that asset value and you do all those adjustments, because these are just adds to the book value we started with, you should get an asset value of about $10.5 billion for the enterprise. Because those are just the operating assets. I took off the excess cash or the, or the net cash. How much am I paying for those operating assets? About $500 million. Now, I don't get to buy them. I have to buy the whole company. So if I add back the cash, I'm getting 12, about $12 billion in assets for about $2.24 billion in the stock price. However you cut it, is there a lot of asset protection here, Alejandro? There sure is. Now, what's the big question about this investment? I'm sorry, your name is? Oh, I'm Mike. Uh, Mike. The earnings power. Of the right. Is it really ever going to make any money? How are we going to think about that? Well, let's ask a different question first. Is the global automobile industry going to go away? Is this labor arbitrage between the heavily unionized assemblers and the much more lightly unionized parts companies going to go away? Are their customers going to go away? They might shrink a little, but who are their customers? You actually have in this their sales by customer. And they are the big, who's the second biggest customer? BMW. Is that going away? Daimler is a big customer. <coughs> GM we now know is not going away. But if GM went away, what would have likely happened to Ford sales? They would have gone up. In fact, are these guys deeply embedded in the auto industry except for one group of competitors, the Japanese? So is this business likely to disappear? So some very large fraction of those assets is going to have to get reproduced. And then I'll come back to you, Rob. Yes, go ahead. Well, what would the other players have to invest to be able to do what Magna does? Just answer that question, because we've got a number for that up here. It's about $12 billion. Are they going to do that for $200 million a year in profits? So is that concern about pricing in the long run overstated or understated? Because if you're going to have people replacing all this equipment and doing all this stuff and incurring all this expense to generate this enterprise, do they have to earn a return on that investment? Well, I guess I was thinking of it less in terms of 
competitors coming in as suppliers, but their customers saying we can't afford Do their, this. Right. So their customers say we can't afford this. Yeah. And Magnus says, well, we can't afford it either. What happens then? Cars don't get built. If cars, if people stop building cars, what's going to happen to the price of cars? Again, is the automo global automobile industry going to go away? So ultimately, what does the price of those cars have to do for the profitability of the automakers? Supportive, although the unions, as Jim Chano said, may steal it all. What does it have to do for the profitability of the parts suppliers? Got to keep them in business. So I come back again. Is the pricing to survive an issue for the car companies in the end? Do you understand the strategic assumptions we're making? Because this is an economically viable industry. It requires continually renewed investment, like that $575 million to design the new parts that they design every year requires training new workers, requires replacing the plants, and so on. Can that survive on no profit? And if it's going to survive, what does that tell you in some sense about price? I'm sorry, you, yes, go ahead, Mike. So one kind of consideration I was thinking of is that you segment the market section, not just automobiles, it's SUVs and large cars versus mid and small size cars. Does that really sound like it? I mean, what kind of assemblies do they make? What are the differences between SUVs and small cars? Do they have the same dashboard assemblies, same basic instruments in that dashboard. But they're not a design end. Well, I mean, what's right? You have a list of the models that they depend on. Are they really all going away? Read that list out. Is a Saturn Outback a big car? Is a Saturn a big car? Is the Outback a big car? The F series is a big car. So that could conceivably go down. But if GM doesn't sell those cars, what's going to happen to other cars that are sold? They're going to go up, but those are going to be smaller cars. There is it your sense that these guys have a specialty by component, or they have a specialty by car? It looks like the design of the car. They ultimately are moving into cars, but typically, how is the automobile parts supplier industry organized? Is it specialized by component, or is it specialized by model? Sorry? Component. Of course. You think these guys are stupid? We'll see about that. So why don't we go ahead and do an estimate of earnings power that they've historically had to see how reasonable those earnings are apt to be. Is that a coming? Go ahead, Roy. Uh, so, if one were to use uh, SGNA to project multiplied by like, three times four times, also mm -hmm. Yes. What do you want to do, though? You want to do one, the other, or both? Okay, you've got two ways of getting at the intangibles here. One is to actually look at processes in the market that reproduce them search firms that hire workers, sales organizations that produce sales and what they charge, R&D directly. And we get a number from that. Do we want to just use that number, or do we want to see if it looks reasonable in terms of the level of their SG&A? Suppose their SG&A were 100 million. Would these numbers look reasonable? No, they wouldn't. So my question to you is, do you want to do one or both methods? What are we trying to fix here the best we can on what the value of this company is 
And the more creative ways you can do that, the better off you're going to be. Here's the history of earnings, upside down and backwards. What does the history of margins look like? And by the way, I'm giving you all the way through the early 2000s, but also you've got a fairly extensive history on operating margins through the recent crisis. Does it look like they ever stopped making money? What's a good average return, would you say, just looking at that average return? What do you want to do, Mike? Is it going to be the same as in the glory days back here of 7 and 8? Of 6 and 7, sorry. Uh, no. By the way, well, actually, no, it's 7 and 8. 6, 7, and 8. It's probably going to be a little bit higher than that, below the deep part of the saw of 7.8. Right. What, what do you think is a good number that you'd like to rely on? 5, 4? Four. How about 4%? Four Is that okay with you, Mike? Sure. Okay, so if we want to do an earnings power now, let's start with that enterprise. Let's take a sustainable margin of 4%. Their revenue probably sustainably is about $24 billion. That's sort of where they've been. It's above what it is this particular bad year. It's less than it was at the peak. Gives you a sustainable EBIT of 960 then you've got taxes of 320. Their tax rate is about a third. You have a tax rate district. Gives you 640 in EBIT. Do they have excess depreciation or are they under depreciate? Anybody look at that? They have huge excess depreciation. The way you can see that most obviously is if you just look at last year's depreciation, how did it compare to capital expense? It was actually greater than total capital expense. Now, they're not growing much, so maybe it's all maintenance capex, so that they do say in the footnote, some of it is to drive down costs. But it looks like there's another about $134 billion million in excess depreciation. Do you want to rely just on that? No, of course not. Do you want to check that? How could you check to see if that one year number was reasonable? Well, you got a lot of history here. So suppose what I did was is I compared over the whole 10 year period from 1999 to 2008 depreciation against capital expense. And what you get is you get total depreciation of 5882, capital expense of, five, of 7651. Sales grew by 17 billion. You probably have to about 15, point, 15 to 16 cents of capital for every dollar of sales. So say you have growth capex for that whole 17 billion of 2.7 billion roughly. That would leave out of this 7 billion plus total capital expense, 4.9 of maintenance capital expense. Over the 10 years, you got 92 billion in excess depreciation. Are 924 million. It's about 100 million a year in excess depreciation, it looks like. I think that's going up or down over time as they get bigger. It's got to be going up over time as they get much bigger. In light of that history, does it look like the 134 for excess depreciation is a reasonably good number? Yes, it's consistent with history, it's consistent with what we see this year where there's no growth. So what we're left with then, because at the moment that's shielded by taxes, we've got to add back the excess depreciation. We could tax effect it, but it's about 707, something, something between 750 and 800 million of excess of after-tax net operating profit. Just adding back the 134 in excess depreciation. If I have a 10% whack here, assuming this is an all-equity company, which it is, that gives me about $7.74 billion in earnings power. That's for the enterprise to compare to the 498. 
If I added back the 17.42 million net cash, I get 9.5 billion roughly, and there's the and that's the value of the equity compared to the asset value. Does that tell a story? And let me ask it this way: Do you feel comfortable with that earnings power value, Mike? Let's forget the details. Does that story seem consistent? What does it say about the earnings power of this company compared to the earnings power needed to sustain the assets? Is it higher or lower? Looks like it's lower. So if we're right or close to right on the asset value, are those earnings protected? From entry by the necessity for anybody who's going to displace them in this industry that we agree is going to be viable to make a comparable investment. So, do I have to argue about the details of that 224 billion? You thought it was going to go down to 15. Would that be a viable industry at an asset value of 12 or even 10 billion, and an earnings power value, say, of six? It would. People would replace those assets if they're only making six billion in earnings on a necessary investment of 10 billion. What would have to happen to prices in that case? Of course. And in the long run, is this going to be a viable industry when? In the red sweatshirt, I'm really good at that. <laughs> Jake, when Jake talked about the nature of this business, did it seem like a bad business that was going to go away? What did you do that they taught you to do in 6301 that is a complete waste of time? <laughs> decided to jigger the numbers in your stupid estimate of earnings power. Why do I say that that's not the way you want to proceed? Here? Because you've got a lot of information about the strategy of the company, the viability of the industry, the cost of reproducing the assets that are a check on the sensibleness of this earnings power. Right, Mike? Just I say yes. <laughs> I'm flying here. <laughs> One thing is, auto manufacturing is a global industry, and as a part supplier, you're... Is it a global industry? Let's talk about that. It is to some extent, but where do, the, where do Hondas and Lexuses and Toyotas get made that are sold in the United States? In the Southeast Asia? <laughs> they get made in the United States. Why? So they can, it's cheaper to avoid... Uh... Does that suggest it's a global industry if it's cheaper to produce locally? There are some cars you can move, and it is there are a fair amount of imports in cars, but there are a big part of this industry that's local. Well, say the locality is the U.S., so you've got two regions. You've got where these guys are, and you've got the southeast where right. you guys are, which has greater cost advantage, which is greater brand power, which is taking share. Right, but if the asset value is impaired here by say a third. Don't forget, half of it is in Europe, half of it is in the United States. So to be impaired by a third, how much of the United States value would have to go away? More than half of their U.S. Of the value of their U.S. assets. Because if there was impaired by a quarter in the United States, you'd have the half in Europe that's still good, and you'd have half of the half in the United States, which would add up to three quarters. Is the impairment of that level look reasonable? 
If I do it and the value, I cut down that asset value by 25%, what's the net asset value look like? 12 billion to what? Well, how does that compare to the earnings power? Then? So have we already built that in when we did this 4% margin? Yes. <laughs> but you don't want to touch this sucker. I would at 20, absolutely. I wouldn't add, I think the asset value is like $101 or something like that per share. Right. I would definitely never pay $101. No, no, nobody's asking you to pay $101. we are asking you to set a reasonable value on this. What would be a reasonable conservative value of this without your jigger around the damn discounted cash flow? But what you've seen and what you've heard from Jake and Raul about the nature of this industry. Remember, we're trying to tie this down with facts that we know, information we can rely on, and assumptions about the nature of the industry that we can trust. Give me a number. 50 or 60 bucks. Don't give me a number in terms of the value of the industry. Got 948 up there. Uh, what does that work out to? Share 112 million shares. So 948 is about 80 to 90 bucks a share. At that earnings power, I would definitely not trust all of the stuff that's all the way. You have to trust them all to be true. When you do the discounted cash flow, do all the assumptions have to be true? Yes, they do. Are the assumptions here mutually triangulated? So do they all have to be wrong, not just one at a time, to get this to be? Suppose the assumptions on the asset value are good, and the assumptions on the earnings power are bad. Does that make sense? Does that tell a sensible story? No, why? Because it would mean the industry would be non-viable and what would happen to prices and therefore return? So what does it say if just one of the assumptions is wrong? It's no longer a consistent story. You begin to see the advantage of valuing something from this perspective. You've got a great career ahead of you as an investment banker. You've got to be more out there. Yes, go ahead. Maybe just as a follow-up question, in today's market, where prices aren't quite as good, but this thing's trading at $55 a share. Yes, we're framing it at an asset value about 100 I mean, is it a good buy in today's market? Because it looks like earnings power is a good game. Or maybe you think it's worth 85 bucks and could be worth more. What do you think? Just trying to figure out what's the right market. Well, all right, let's go to $20 a share, which is what it was trading for. Alejandro, we're showing values here that even Mike would accept are way above $20 per share, right? Are we just wrong about our valuation? Why do we believe that this is, in fact, a reasonable story? I'll tell you one of the reasons we believe it, because we prevented presented this analysis at the fund where I work at $19 a share, when it was almost all cash you were buying. And they said, this is a disgusting company and a disgusting industry. We're not touching it. You think that goes on a lot? Does that create the opportunity for us? So there's something else supporting this decision which is that this fits perfectly the profile that we're concerned with. Now, oh, I, got, I, I know it's an A and an N. Anu. Anu, close enough. <laughs> Anu, what are the problems that you would like to look at and do further research on to see if this was indeed a reasonable investment? What about the Stronox, right? Could this all be fraudulent? What about that possibility? 
because we're relying on the financial statements here. So we've talked about the automobile industry. We could look at the customers, as Mike had, at the history of the performance of this through good times and bad times. But what about the Stronox? Is there a way we can get our hands around that issue? Or do we have to do what they did at this fund and just walk away? Anybody? How do you want to think about that? Yes? Uh, I know they said they're com committed to giving a certain amount of their earnings away in uh, dividends. Right. That, that kind of puts a cap on That might be a good thing. Like, one thing you might look at is, do they have an economic interest in this company? Beyond that, and the thing about Frank Stronach is, he's willing to steal small. He owns 22% of the economic interest of this company. And he's still diddling around with the racetracks and other things. So he does have some coincident economic interest. Where in the history of this company does it suggest that that might protect us, Jim? You talked about it. Of this company, does it suggest that he's not going to drive it into the ground with his dual class control? Well, was he willing to empire build at any price? When the price for Chrysler got too rich, did he stay in the game? When the price for Opal started to get too rich, was he willing to get in a bit of more? When Belinda got too rich, did he decide to make her Prime Minister of Canada? Yes. So we have some signs in the history. Anything else about this? I mean, how do we know this is an Enron? Anybody? Yes. Well, he, he's not on the cover of Forbes. Exactly. If you are the company of the year, if you are the leading new economy company, when you go to your auditors and say, I think you ought to do this because this is the way it works, what are the auditors likely to say? Absolutely. Let's talk about it. If you are the most <coughs> notorious business gum bucket in Canada with a terrible history and you go to your auditors and say, I think we should do it this way, what are the auditors likely to say? Not a chance. And in fact, who are the auditors for this book? Ernst Sorry? Ernst and Young. They have a respectable firm, and you want to ask yourself, are they going to let somebody with Stronach's reputation get away with the kind of stuff that went on at them? Yes? Uh, I mean, the, their customer base also gives you some comfort? Like, their yeah. customer base also gives you comfort. Who are they dealing with? They are not Bernie Madoff dealing with an accountant and a back office in a strip mall in New Jersey. <laughs> so that ought to give you some power. Yes? It gives you some comfort. He's willing to put money into your hands. And ultimately, that's what you've got to do. You've got to ask yourself, can I track the money? And is it going someplace useful, or is it disappearing? And let's start with the fiction that he maintains, and let's look at it over a long period. So this is, respectively, 10 years of earnings and 5 years of earnings. That's what he tells us he's making. What I want to subtract is the first thing I can count on, that it's very hard for him to lie about, which is the dividends and buybacks. If you look over the 10 years, the dividends and buybacks are a billion oh seven three. Over the last five years, it's seven eighty nine. That means what got reinvested in the company, or he's pretending is reinvested in the company, are four billion over the 10 years, instead of 1.8 billion over the five years. What's the next most reliable piece of information that it's very hard to lie about? unless you're Italian. <laughs> it's cash and debt. That's easy for the auditors to check. So let me next subtract the increase in net cash going back to the balance sheet 
at the beginning of 1999, at the end of 98, to the end of 2008. Net cash increased by 1359. Over the last four or five years, it increased by 620. So of this reinvested earnings, only 2.8 billion got invested in the business. In the last five years, sort of 1.2 billion got reinvested. What's the next thing It's very hard to fake in the long term? It's sales. Because you've got to get the money from the sales side. You can jigger with accounts receivable in the short term. But going from $6 billion to $24 billion, where you actually identify who the customer is, is very hard to do. So that long-term sales growth number is probably a reasonable number. Over this period, Sales went up by 17 billion, just over. That meant he invested about 16 cents for each dollar of sales. What's he reporting as operating earnings? About four cents for each dollar of sales. Does it look like he's doing a good job of capital allocation? And it's over a very long period of time. This money is not disappearing into the sunset. If you did it over five years, sales increased by 8.4 billion roughly for the 1.2 billion investment. It's about 14 cents of investment for each dollar of incremental sales. And again, that's with a four cent profit or even a three and a half cent profit or a three cent profit. Does it look like the money is disappearing here that he claims he made in earnings? It does not. If we did this for Enron, what do you think you would have seen? If we just tracked the reported earnings versus the increase or the increase in net cash, what do you think net cash was doing at Enron while they were reporting all these earnings? It was dropping like a rock, as it was at Worldcom. What do you think was happening to dividends at Enron? They weren't paying any. Buybacks were really limited. Same for WorldCom. No dividends, no buybacks. What do you think was the rate of increase of sales at WorldCom for reinvesting the $10 billion in profits they reported? Zero. Sales were actually falling. So there, the money is just disappearing. Same with Enron. It just disappears. You could not have spotted the fraud and you would have known that there was huge misallocation of investment going on. So what you want to do is track over long periods of time based on the most reliable elements of that balance sheet and income statement how well they're doing at deploying those profits that they say they're making. And when you look at this picture, does it look like you're actually being cheated by Frank Stronach beyond what's disclosed. No, he's actually a surprisingly good operator and capital allocator. So now I come back to you, Alessandro, for the last word. Wouldn't you have invested in this company at $20 a share? At the moment, I would invest in it. Should you have been afraid? What were you What did you essentially have to be afraid of? That there was not going to be a global automobile industry that was buying ever. Was that a reasonable fear? No. And that's what's built into these numbers. So I hope you have a sense that doing it this way, when you are confronted with these ugly, diseased, disappointing opportunities, you can actually triangulate the information to have reasonable comfort about what you're buying. And that's what the value approach to valuation is all about. It's deploying the information to get the best consistent picture of what this company is worth. Thank you. Jay, thank you. Alessandro, thank you.
So I think what you should do is at the end of the semester, when you've all got ask us to take available policies. Okay? But if you let it go on during school, we'll travel in the first year. And we'll just lose the value of what you can see. This is an analysis we actually share. And there are two of us who want to do it. Portfolio managers, uh, this is discussed in the market, and it looks like a good job. And we had all sorts of accounting reasons why it shouldn't be done. And we knew from the accounting members that those were not a problem. We went to accounting and she got a family and she made a million bucks. And she said,
Mm-hmm. So they don't have... Because the asset value and the earnings and power value are about the same. I think Mike is right. We actually did Mike's haircut recorded, yeah. which is why we knew that it gave us exactly an asset value, very almost exactly the same as the earnings value. And we found that reassuring. Is there a big power gap on the side of this administration? Who are not going to let them say this is a convincing story about this industry. This is a good operator. He's got a lot of assets. He's got a bad situation, but in the long run, there are enough earnings there, so we're okay to at least have But their incremental ROIs is not really like that. No, no. What you're trying to test with that is, is money disappearing? Are those profits fantasy? And the answer is no, it's not disappearing. Yeah. Because okay. after the, you look at what's retained, you look at what's retained that doesn't go into net cash, and that doesn't grow disproportionately to sales. Okay? Yeah, sure. And those are all numbers that are hard to fake. Yeah, the reason I find that it's not about taking part, I'm just finding out the incremental part to the how I You are, look, I'm out. telling you, I'll tell you what I think is going on. Were you an engineer? No. Oh, what did you <laughs> What? Uh, I was doing trading. No, no, what in college? Undergrad uh, arts, liberal arts. Oh, really? So this <laughs> is... <laughs> <laughs> the point of all these numbers, in the end, I, what was the most valuable part of my discussion? The huge difference in value. No, the story being consistent. These numbers are about telling stories. And the story you wanted, it's very different in Enron very different in world because you ought to do this simple task for them. But they're supposedly reinvesting all the money in the business, and it doesn't show up in years It doesn't show up in the process. It's not a story that hangs together. These guys are reinvesting this in the business, and per dollar they put in the sales, it's not a It's a story that hangs together. This is not about a formula on incremental returns. We're not doing this for that reason. Got it. We never rely on it. What we're trying to say is, is that earnings number a fantasy figure? Mm-hmm. Is that clear? Sure. Okay, so go back to your English roots. <laughs> and tell me a question. Which, what would we see in the case of Warcom or Enron here? I mean, zero. Oh, you'd see oh, zero, yeah. bro, you know, you'd see zero, zero, infinite, zero, infinite right. yeah. Worldcom for sure. Net debt is exploding. Sales are going down. And they're reporting huge profits that they're not distributing. <laughs> what do you think is going on? So net cash is huge negative. They're reporting big profits. So then you have to add back the quote decline in net cash. And they're not growing. So we're and they're not paying that out. So it's all going into the company for no growth. And so you don't know if that's a fraud. But if it's not a fraud, it's the worst capital allocation you've ever seen in your life. Is that clear? Got it. It's just that there's not a consistent story. And notice all the numbers in this story, except the profit number, are numbers that are hard to find. All right. So I just want to kind of conclude the point I was trying to make. Can I borrow one here? Yes. This one here. So. All right. So the way I viewed at it, you know it the thing is worth less than replacement cost because no one's moving to Detroit or any of these regions. They're all moving. No, you know part of it is worth less than replacement cost. Okay. And you know that at the moment mm-hmm. the earnings are less than replacement cost because the auto industry is very simple. Mm-hmm. But the, when the auto industry picks up, and it will because it wears out and you've got to have cars, mm-hmm. it's going to have to trade close to replacement cost. Unless so, so part, you know, part of it, let's talk about what I think is your fear. Sure. Which is part of these assets are not replaced. And those are the ones that are in part of what's in the trade. Yeah. Okay, now. And so And they're not, by the way, they're not all in the trade. Well, they're Actually, Hamilton, right, they're right. in all these other places. Right, but they're but they're but they're pretty spread out. Massive. That's it. Now, that's why I did the calculation. Yeah. Half of it is in Europe is not going mm-hmm. If half of the US goes away, half of North America. That means they lose a half of a half. It's a quarter. Which a quarter. Which means the asset value is not 12 billion, but three quarters of 12 billion. Mm-hmm. 
But it's very close to earnings power. But on the earnings power side, kind of one of the points I was driving at is... No, no, but now we've done the asset value and done the haircut, so you're fucked on earnings power, Mike. Well, if it's... You have to, if, those, if the rest if of those assets are in viable places, and I think you'd have a hard case to make, that you've got to write down more than 70, more than 25% of these assets. Well, then the earnings power has to be enough to support well, the them. Earning, the earnings power needs to justify the replacement, basically. Yes. In the end, so it is all about, it is definitely part of that earnings power. You don't no, have no, no, but then look, if you do your stupid, no, forgive me, sorry. <laughs> well, if you do your numbers, yeah. and you get an earnings power value of $4 billion against an asset replacement value of $9 billion, how good are your earnings numbers? Or it would imply that you're not going to replace these assets. Right, but we already wrote off the assets that we know are not going to get replaced. And what we're left with is the ones in Europe and in other parts of the United States that are going to get replaced. But you can't be sure they're going to be replaced. You can't be sure of anything. But what's your guess about those assets? Do you think the U.S. automobile industry, not counting the Japanese, is going to fall to less than half its current size? How far has it fallen already? Oh, it's right now it's 50-50. And that's already Where in these was it numbers. 20 years ago? Doesn't matter. That's 20 years ago is not in these numbers. Well, I would say 20 these years ago, you could look forward no, 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 and no, no, say no. 70-30, right. it's going to stay that way. But I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, the thing but, is, okay, so you went down from sort of, and it changed dramatically. Yeah. You can see it happen mm -hmm. in, the, in the 1980s. Yeah. So this happened a long time ago. But, so right now, and right now you've got the Japanese are basically 40-60. So but what you're saying is if we cut their U.S. business by half, what are we saying the U.S. share, the U.S. company share of the U.S. market is going to be? It would be 25%. Well, it would be 30. 30. Would be yeah, 30. 30. So 60. 60 would go to 30. So you're saying it's going to be worse than 70, 30 U.S. manufacturers? US in the U.S.? In the U.S.? Be. It could be, but is it reasonable? You cannot do, look, just because yeah. something is going to happen yeah. doesn't make it a reasonable I, guess. I, and you know what creates opportunities like this? Because people like you who are disgusted at this I'm idea, not disgusted. I think don't it's a look good, carefully I think and say it could happen. I think it's, I think it's, there could be a nuclear attack next week and we'd all be screwed. I think it's a good business. <laughs> but the main point I'm trying to make is on the earnings power. So this, like the 4%, that seems reasonable, 4 or 5, uh, all these other numbers look look reasonable and they're probably right. The main drive, in my mind, the point I was trying to make is the main driver of what the earnings power is, is revenue. No! Why not? Wrong! Sustainable the main driver is assets. That's the point I'm trying to beat into your head. But if no one's buying Why their do we cars... They're going to buy cars, Mike. They're not going to stop buying cars. But you're not the only supplier of cars. It doesn't matter. Whoever the supplier of cars is, they're going to have to have these parts, and they're going to have to produce those these assets. And if you've got them and they don't, do guess what you're going to do to those people who build the cars? Do you think there's an excess of auto-producing assets in the U.S.? Yes. Why is that relevant? So that implies that there's an oversupply, so everything... Oh, no, no, no. They're in the assembly plants, there's huge excess. There's not in the parts companies. Huge excess. Parts companies don't have... Well, how they're supplying us with 16 million automobiles two years ago, and now... Oh, because the... Look, the are we going to get back to 16? The auto, no, no. The auto assembly plants are huge fixed cost engines. Yeah. These guys are not huge. There, there are lots of little... I mean, how many, so what, how many pieces do you think they make? to make a tremendous amount, probably. But and ultimately, you think, really, we're going to go down to 10 million cars a year? Well, say we do 13 instead of 15. No, no, but ultimately, what's the population going to want? Do you think, long run, people spend incrementally more or less on cars? I think replacement cycles are going to continue to lag out. Yeah. And I think you're going to... what happened is the replacement cycles lagged out. What happened to total production of cars in the U.S. over the last 15 years? It's gone up. Right. So why are you suddenly, you're, you're telling because all these stories that have no basis in history about how more than half the U.S. supplied market is going to disappear. But and what? that seems to me a crazy assumption. I would think that... And the only way it makes sense is if you just do earnings power alone, which is what you were talking about, and forget the economic constraint that there has to be enough profit here. 
to justify the asset price. And the point I'm making is there might not be enough profit to justify the asset price. Then they're not going to build the plants, and they're not going to supply the parts, and they're not going to build the cars. And so the assets just slowly depreciate away. No, no, that's slow. And they're not going to build the cars. Yes. And nobody in America is going to buy cars made in America? The amount of people is going to go down from 16 to say it's 13. And we're at 13 for the next... Watch my lips. Yes. If we're at 16, how much... We were I, at 16. Right. If we were at 16, how much of a haircut do I have in my mind of asset value? So you said 50% of the U.S. You have the U.S. production. Yes. Okay. So from the U.S. The production three. is 8. From the big, the big three. three is 8. And I wrote down 50% of that is 4. And if I subtract 4 from 16, what do I get? Four from six, so you get a uh, twelve. Right. Duh. Yeah. No, I. Uh, I'm just so saying. You, tell me what you're saying, because everything you've said so far has been contradicted by reasonable numbers. What you're doing is an apocalyptic scenario that assumes this industry completely goes away. What I'm saying is, in this case, earnings powers is a key metric because it's an oversupplied okay. industry. This is your biggest problem. Yes. Earnings power is not exogenously given. That's your biggest problem. You think earnings power drives asset values. It, is it drives investment. If it is, right, but it is exactly the opposite. What drives earnings power? If you have to have an industry is going to be viable, can you do it with no investment? No, but if an industry so, is okay. decreasing in size, no, no, you can what, what drives no, entrance? You, excess you, earning power. What the, drives no, exit? No, no, it's not excess earnings power. Look. Suppose the industry is decreasing in size. Yes. Does that mean it does zero investment? It is maintenance investment. And is that significant or not? That is significant. And but you have to, to justify the maintenance investment, earn a return on that maintenance investment. Yes. So you have to earn the return whether it's shrinking or not. But maintenance investment is a very different number than replacement. It doesn't matter. People still wouldn't make it if they were on an earning return. I agree, but that number is so much less. It's not so much less because you've got to replace. Look, what's the cycle for the design of the new dashboard components? How many years is that? Probably five years. Five years. So every five years they've got to replace that completely. And yeah. that's just maintenance investment, right? Yeah. So what's the what's the replacement cycle on the labor force? What's turnover do you think in this labor force? So every four years, the person retires. Right. Well, no, no, no. There's a lot of turnover. There are a lot of long-serving workers, but at the short end, you're recruiting workers all the time. Mm -hmm. So you got to be able to hire the workers, and you have that capital stock. But there's an excess of workers in Detroit, or any. It doesn't matter. They're not trained workers. I'm sure they're trained workers. No, listen, trust me. You have a skilled worker. Unemployment in Detroit's like 20%. It doesn't matter. Who do you think's in that 20%? Probably unskilled, semi-skilled, and skilled. Right, and skilled who actually can work and do exactly the jobs that need to be done at, uh, at uh, Magnum. I have to imagine there are unemployed engineers who okay, have the okay. skills. Let me ask you this. Yes. Oh, very few. Well, no, forget that. Where does most education uh, on the job. Right. So you have somebody who comes in with no on-the-job training. All of a sudden, they're going to be a fully competent worker. But they could be from Duro or any right. other. Right, and, 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 they, and they are going to work exactly the same as Duro as they do at Magnum. So yeah. they're really going to go to Magnum and be able to do their job the first day? No, but what's how long does it take to ramp up? We know that. It takes about six to eight months. Okay. Which is half. And so that's eighty thousand dollars. No. What did I put per worker? Oh, sorry, ten k. Right. But that investment takes place all the time <coughs> because you've always got turnover. Okay. That's maintenance capex. Okay. Okay. So we've done the workers, and we've done you know you've still got to go through the process of selling to the people who are there. I don't know. The airline industry's got a lot of assets, and they're not. What is it? Anything. What is it about the airline industry that makes it different from this one? Well, you've got long-lived assets. You got really long-lived assets. 
and everybody loves that business. Did, nobody, has anybody made any money in the aircraft industry? Never. Have there been a lot of new airlines? Yes. How many new car companies have been there? There's Tesla. They just came out. How many new car companies broadly compared to the other companies? Significantly less. Right. Why? How many new movie studios are there? There's a decent amount of very small ones. Right. They come in and go all the time. Yeah. What is it? Which is the auto industry more like? Which is the airline industry more like? The movie industry? It's like the movie industry. Or the car industry. It's like the movie. Industries that are shitty industries are almost all auto industries. Okay. Where people just love the idea of getting in and they do the discounted cash flows. Mm -hmm. And they just say, okay, this is going to work. But the biggest thing I've got to teach you to do is to understand assets for capital not the other way. I'll keep, I'll keep if you had If you had no assets here, Ultimately, what would the earnings power be? If you could get into this business with no assets, like the other business. Other than just the earnings power would just decrease, prices would fall. It has to be zero. Yeah. By the same token, if you need a lot of assets and the industry is viable, and these replacement cycles take place all the time, unless there's somebody who's stupid and just likes to lose money. There's always capital. This is, look, this is Ben Graham's insight, mm -hmm. which is that assets in these kinds of markets, without barriers to entry, are what drive earnings. Mm -hmm. And they drive earnings on the, you know, the level of upper earnings can't rise. And ultimately, they're the level of return earnings can't rise. Okay. I understand what you're saying. But <laughs> so what if you came out with an earnings power of value? Oh, no, no, sorry, I handed it in her. Yeah. I, I just needed I the numbers. That, I, I would think that my number on the early one margin was going to be suspicious, right? Yeah, of course. So, what if, so you could attribute it to either a mistake or crappy management. So right, it could have, could have been crappy management. But would you and that's use the last analysis? Yes, you always thought crappy. Of course. I mean, the first thing you see is, that, in fact, when we did it first, because Mike is basically right about the write down in the asset. Uh, it's just that you, that gets you almost exactly the earnings count, which is deeply reassuring <laughs> about the earnings counts. So, no, you do the last analysis because these numbers could be phony. And so what you want to do is ask the question, if I start with the phony number, which is the profit number, and I then adjust it for all the numbers that can't be fake, do I get a bottom line that makes sense? Seems to show good in terms of the public Which would be inconsistent with the full versus. Right, right, exactly. But it's again, look, the crucial thing here is the story. Putting all the information together, not doing the super set of numbers, and saying, I think it's going to be a super set of numbers, and you say, no, I think it's going to be right. So you never have a company with So you don't have local. I mean, you don't have the, the, the plan yes, yes, to start That's another one. But the other thing is, people love their own. Look, who, I was who's, there. The, who's the last person who lost a lot of money in their own? Because he just knows it. You know, Sydney, right? Sorry, I didn't hear. Who's the last person who wasted Branson? Their, no. Well, Branson is one. Warren Buffett. Oh, right. Net, 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 Net chance has been his answer. Yeah. <laughs> People love their yeah. I, I used to work in Berlin and last year in one of my interviews someone asked me, it was a really good question in an interview, what do you think people have in airlines? Now, you also, by the way, guys have a big job. Because this, as you see, is a different course yeah. than yeah. last year. So you're going to, I mean, partly we're going to count on the evaluations, but the most important evaluations are going to come. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so what then? So, <laughs> okay. so what you guys need to do, and if you spend, as I say, more than 100 hours, like they pay you what, how much? What's the fee? I don't even know if it's split. Oh, you don't? I thought we have enough people in this class. So you're, you're, the TA's for both classes, right? Uh, yes. 
Well, last I mean, you, Right, but the thing is that you should get like $1,200. What are you getting paid? It's, um, it's like $100 for every two weeks, I think. Ah, so it's six times a year. Yeah. Labor negotiations. So you're going to sell these. You guys are only going to sell